We uh, finished the book of 2 Corinthians. If you have a Bible, you want to open to 2 Corinthians chapter 13 tonight for our message, your final exam. You see, Paul the Apostle is talking to the Corinthians, and in this passage, he's going to tell them to examine themselves. All of us, if you have any uh, age whatsoever under your belt, you've got a lot of exams under your belt, right? You had grade school tests and exams. You had high school tests and exams. Those who are in college right now, this, this next week and this week is a week of finals, their final exams for this year as they are going to be released for the summer break. And when you want to go get your driver's license, you need an eye exam. Certain jobs, you need a physical, a health exam. Other things you need, if you're just going to apply for a job, they're going to give you a series maybe of exams. I remember the first time as a teenager, I went to uh, apply basically for a box boy job at a grocery store, and, and I got the uh, um, exam to, you know, how I could stack things in a bag and different things, and, and I hadn't really practiced that, so I, did, I didn't get the job. I just kind of threw it all in there and said, hey, you know, it's totable, it's carryable, but, you know, I, I didn't pass their uh, exam, so to speak. And there are things that people are, when they're examining us, and for some time, Paul the Apostle has been under examination by the Corinthians. They said, oh, he's kind of, you know, weak in appearance, kind of wimpy in his speech, and his letters are really weighty and strong and powerful, but when he shows up, his physical presence is, is very wimpish, basically. And, and they had lost respect for Paul. And so they had been judging him. They had been examining him. They had been criticizing him. And Paul the Apostle now turns this around, and he doesn't want to examine them. He doesn't want to be critical with them. He's correcting them like a parent would to a child so that they would grow. But he now is going to exhort them that one of the most important things that needs to happen in some of their lives is self-examination. And that self-examination, only you can do it. Only they can do it. You see, your husband or wife can't do it. Only you can do it. Are you in Jesus, and is Jesus in you? You see, there's kind of a danger in, uh, in a church body. There are people that have an oversensitive conscience, and they constantly, 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 never-endingly question their salvation. And you're, as you minister to them and you pastor them, you're, you're giving them all the Bible verses of assurance. And oh, there's a bunch of wonderful Bible verses of assurance. Uh, Nobody's greater than the Father, and we are in his hand and in Jesus' hand, and nobody is able to snatch you out of his hand. He is able to present you faultless and blameless before his throne. I mean, there's all these wonderful promises, Philippians 1, 6, that the good work that Jesus has begun, I mean, he, God's going to perform it till the day of Jesus Christ. But there's another danger and sometimes people, they, they won't face this other danger. And, and there's a time and a place. And as we see the, the fi final exam, if you will, of 2 Corinthians, Paul the Apostle is going to put the congregation at Corinth just like he's going to put us on the spot tonight. And he's going to examine the opposite end of the spectrum. Not the people that need comfort all the time because they're forever questioning their salvation, but those who think, they're saved, and actually they're not. They show up to church. They might have a Bible. They're known to others that they come to church. They're, they're a member of this congregation. Do you know churches in America are chock full with people that are on their, think they're on their way to heaven, but if they would examine themselves, they would find out that Jesus is not in them, and they're not in him, and they are lost souls destined for eternity without God unless they examine themselves and get radically saved. So there's two ends of the spectrum, and I want to mention the one. That is the people that need assurance. I want you to know this message is not for them tonight, okay? It's for those who need to examine themselves to see if they're in the faith. Now, check it out. We're going to look at basically three thoughts in this passage from verse 5 through verse 14. We're going to look at the exam. We're going to look at the farewell exhortation. And then we're going to look at the closing affection that Paul communicates. Look at the exam. Let's read verses 5 through 10. 
Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you are disqualified? Verse six, but I trust that you will know that we are not disqualified. Now I pray to God that you do no evil, not that you should, we should appear approved, but that you should do what is honorable, though we may seem disqualified. For we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. For we are glad when we are weak and you are strong. And this also we pray, that you may be made complete. Therefore I write these things being absent, lest being present, I should use sharpness according to the authority which the Lord has given me for edification and not for destruction. Check it out in verse five as we began. He says, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. It's really two words. Examine yourself to observe your inner soul, to know if Christ is in you and you are in Christ. If you are born again, if you know who Jesus is your Savior, not just a religious person, you have to understand why are you going to be able to go to heaven? It's not because of your good works. It's not because you come to church. It's not because you know some Bible verses. It's not because you tithe. It's not because of any of those things. All those things follow salvation as part of the Christian life, but they do not make you a saved person. So the first is to test or to examine the sec- or to examine yourself, and then he says, test yourselves or prove yourselves. You see, there's an examination, and then is there proof that salvation is operating in your life? Can you look at your life and see that there is an affectionate love relationship between you and the Son of God? Because you see, as he says, but that Jesus Christ is in you, in verse five, unless indeed you are disqualified. Now, the King James has that strong word, unless you are reprobate. Now, three times in this passage, he's gonna say, unless indeed you are disqualified or reprobate, and then he's gonna say, I trust that you don't think we are disqualified or reprobate. And then at the end of verse seven, he says, though we may seem disqualified to you or reprobate. Reprobate or disqualified, or this Greek word, means to basically be a person that fails a test. You're a counterfeit. If, if somebody, a banker, you try to pass a counterfeit bill to them, and if that is discovered to be counterfeit, that would be, you would be found out to be reprobate. That would be a reprobate bill. It's a counterfeit, it's false, it's phony. It's not the real deal. And you know how they train tellers, according to someone telling me this. I've never been a bank teller. But the way that they train a bank teller to find a counterfeit is they don't show them all the varieties of counterfeit. What they do is they have them count real money, real money, real money, real money, real money, real money. And they just keep doing it and they keep doing it. And pretty soon there's a feel and there's a look and there's everything about this. And the teller, and then after the training goes for so long and they've been handling real money, what they do is they slip in a good counterfeit and they're going real, 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 real. Hey, what's this? And it awakens them because they deal with the real thing all the time. And the church is filled. And I don't mean just our congregation, though it is true of our congregation like any other congregation, but I mean churches around the world are filled with reprobate or disqualified people because you see, ultimately, they're counterfeits. They're not the real deal. Somebody like a Judas Iscariot that every, did did anybody guess that he was a counterfeit? No. It wasn't like when Jesus said, hey, one of you is going to betray me. It wasn't like the other 11 went, aha. Judas is over in the corner with his handlebar mustache like snidely whiplash. No, he looked good. They didn't, they, didn't, they didn't think anything. When he went out that night, they thought, oh, he's got the money box. He's going to buy something. He's going to buy supplies. He's going to Walmart. Because he was such a good counterfeit. Nobody, Jesus knew, and tonight Jesus knows, and Jesus always knows, Only two people, if you will, the Lord and an individual knows 
whether they are a reprobate. Either they're a genuine, born-again, bona fide Christian, or they're an actor. They're leaning on the wrong things to get them to heaven. Now, when you think about this, he tells them a couple of things, and we're going to kind of do a little exposition of this passage, and then we're going to look at a little, some test verses, if you will, that the Bible gives us. But he says that they should examine themselves to see if Jesus Christ is inside of them, and unless they are disqualified. But he says in verse 6, but I trust that you will know that we are not disqualified. You see, the Corinthians were giving Paul the Apostle such a hard time. Some of them were probably even just saying out loud, I I don't even think he's a real apostle. I just, you know, I mean, they had so lost respect for him. And Paul was letting them know, hey, I'm I'm no reprobate. I'm not disqualified. Jesus is inside of me. And then again, and he says in verse 7, Now I pray to God that you do no evil. He really confronted them in our last study that when he came, some of them had not repented of basically, he just mentioned three things in passing. He said, some of you have, have not repented of your uncleanness. It meant sexual uncleanness. And then he said, of your fornication. And then he said, of your licentiousness or your lewdness, excuse me, which means your lack of restraint. He was coming to town. He was going to be there in the church. And here were people living in sexual uncleanness, sexual fornication, and sexual unres- unrestrained. And he was going to have to deal with that. And so he mentions here, so that they, uh, basically, I pray to God that you do no evil. You know, that you're not living in a lifestyle of sin and evil. And I pray to God that nobody here tonight is living in a lifestyle of sin or evil, that you and the Lord are very acquainted with. You know all about it. I, I pray that that's not the case, but we're a bunch of humans, and we do have this fallen sinful nature, and you might be in our midst, and maybe you haven't been in church forever, but you're just here tonight, and, and you've just been living an evil, sinful life. And Paul is praying that that would not be the case, not that we should appear approved, meaning that I don't want you guys, I'm praying that you're not living an evil, doing any evil, but it's not so that I look better, or we look better, or that we're more approved by God, but that you should do what is honorable, that you would make the right choice to repent, to turn from that, though we may seem disqualified. You, you may have lost respect for pastors. You may have respect, lost respect for an elder. You may have lost respect for a youth minister. You may have lost respect, and you said, they're disqualified, so I'm gonna do whatever. And Paul's saying, no matter what you think about me, you need to be right with God. Paul is convinced that he is right with God. And the standard is this, he says in verse 8, how do you know? How do you know if somebody is, what kind of litmus test can you take? I mean, is there a certain haircut that Christians have? Right? That's the Christian haircut. They're saved. That's not the case, correct? Some have long hair, some have short hair, some of us have no hair. You see, there's all kinds of standards that people begin to raise up. If you dress this way, or if you have this haircut, or ladies, if you don't dress this way, or you do dress that way, or if you don't wear makeup, I mean, they have all these standards, which none of them are biblical. None of them are biblical. But we are going to look at some things that are biblical, because he says in verse 8, for we can do nothing against the truth, but we are for the truth. The standard to know tonight in your life to help you examine yourself is you examine yourself with the truth of God's word. My opinions are worth spit. Your opinions are worth nothing. What matters is what we stand for is the truth of the word of God and you and I both having ourselves under that authority of God's word. For he tells them ultimately in this exam, his goal for them in verse nine is for we We are glad when we are weak and you are strong. And this also we pray that you may be made complete. You have so much maturing to do. You have so much growing to do. That's his his goal for them. And this is the bottom line in verse 10. He is writing to them now, notice, therefore I write these things being absent, lest being present I should use sharpness according to the authority which the Lord has given me for edification and not for destruction. He said, I'm writing ahead of time so that you can have time to examine your heart, that you can have time to get right with God because I'm coming and if you're still living in sin and you're still making a mess, 
mess of things when I get there. I'm going to have to be sharp and harsh, and I don't want to, but God's given me authority so I can do that. But I just want you to be right with the Lord. I've shared with you over and over, but it seems like Paul is exhorting them like a parent does a child. I, I mean, unless you're kind of weird and twisted, you have no joy in correcting your kids. I just want, hey, you just want to, hey, just do what I ask you to do, right? You, you want love and joy and peace in your family, but, and you give them opportunity and you give them opportunity and, and, and you tell them before you leave. Now, I'm going to leave today and I'm going to go to work, but when I come home, when I get home at 5.30, I want your rooms to be clean. You're going to be home at 3.30 after school and I want your rooms to be clean. So I'm telling you now, right? And the kids, yeah, oh, you're telling us now. And then, and then I'm going to come home at 5.30 and if your room's a mess, what's going to happen? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I remember this happened. There was four of us kids, and our stepdad told us, when I get home tonight at 6, you better have cleaned this entire house for your mother and I because both of us are out there working. You guys are all big enough to contribute, and you can clean this house. And I want this house to be spick and span when I come home. And so when we heard his vehicle pull in the driveway, we all went, oh! <laughs> right? And he spanked all of our rear ends. And he came in and he said, I told you this morning before I left. <laughs> and he gave it all to us. But he tried, he tried, if he would have come in and, and we would have just responded and done what he asked us to, right? We wouldn't have, we wouldn't have had the whoop one. And, and for some of us here tonight, you know what? The Lord is just, in his love, he is standing in front of you with like flashing lights saying, bridge out ahead, examine yourself, make sure you're right with the Lord. Now when people ask me, I mean, when I talk to people and they, they're not sure about their salvation and sometimes as they're going through examination, they're not sure because they don't know the Bible versus the truth that we just talked about that is really the standard. So I, I just start and I'm just gonna walk you through really casually. Many of you are, been believers for a very long time. So humor me in this. If somebody's just, hey, are, are, is Jesus in you and are you in Jesus? First, I, I just say, hey, do you know the gospel? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 and 4, it tells us this. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So I ask him, hey, do you understand that? Most people that have been coming for, oh, I understand that. Jesus died for our sins, was buried, and rose from the dead, right? And I say, so that's the gospel. And then I'll say, do you believe that? Oh, yeah, I believe that. I say, okay. Then you've taken the first step. You understand the gospel, and you believe it, and you've, and you've received Christ. So much so that actually it's become a part of your life, as it says in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And then in verse 13 of that chapter, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So I ask him, have you called on the name of the Lord? Have you said, Jesus, save me? Have you said that Jesus is the Lord of my life and that I believe God? God raised him from the dead. Oh yeah, I believe that. So, so you're saved, right? Jesus is in you. You're in him. You, you actually are telling people that Jesus is the Lord of your life. Oh yeah. Some people are living the Christian life in a radical way, but they don't know how to put the verses together to have confidence in that. And so you just walk them through these things. What is the gospel? Do you understand the gospel? Number two, have you embraced the gospel? Do you believe now in a positional righteousness? You've believed unto righteousness. So this is putting us, this is how you examine yourself through these kind of, of verses. And I'm just helping you out here this evening. So if you have believed in him and you've called upon him, you're saved. Now, positional righteousness happens the day you believe in the finished work of Jesus on the cross. So positionally, you're never going to be more righteous than the day you receive Christ. Speaking of positional righteousness. When I received Christ, as I've shared with you many times, I was half drunk. I'd put a couple of drug deals together that day. And I was on my knees in my house. And I said, God, please forgive me for all this wickedness I've been doing. And I received Jesus and he forgave me of my sins. From that day, 32 years ago, that moment, the Lord declared Rick Brown this wretched, stinking, reeking of booze jerk 
I, I don't know how to say it stronger, <laughs> just who, who, who I was, he declared me at that moment 100% righteous from now and all of eternity. Amen. That's called justification, okay? Just as if I'd never sinned. So if any of you have ever prayed to ask Jesus into your life, he's in you and you're in him, just raise your hand for me. Right on? Okay, we got a few that we're going to work on. Let's keep going. So, so positional righteousness, and this is what Christians get really confused about. Because before I go on to that next step, some of you go, yeah, but I've been kind of struggling this week, and it's been hard. And I, I got drunk last week, and maybe you've been walking with Jesus for three years or 30 years. It really doesn't matter. What you just described to me is not about justification. You're a saved soul. We've now changed subjects to sanctification. Sanctification is the process that God cleans you up from glory to glory as you live the Christian life. And the Christian life is full of ups and downs and seasons and all kinds of stuff. But that doesn't mean every time I sin or mess up or fall short that I've lost my salvation. Okay? I know some people that have been saved 900 times. Every time we have an invitation, they're standing up. They're raising their hand. Like, you've been saved and baptized. You've been baptized seven times. I mean, how many times does it take you to finally figure it out that you're saved, you're justified, you, you've received Jesus? Now, sanctification, though, is radically different because sanctification is that process. Now, think about it. I've been saved for 32 years, and from that moment that I was half drunk, I have had all kinds of struggles with things for these 32 years. But all those struggles were a part of the Lord forming Christ in me and changing me into his image and my salvation has never been in question for those 32 years, ever. And it doesn't mean I haven't fallen on my face or been stupid or sinned, but my covenant relation, it's a covenant that I'm in with Jesus has never changed. Think of it. I've been saved for 32 years, but I've been married 30 years. So just two years later, I got married to Tammy. Now, since the, from the day I made these incredible promises and I made a covenant with Tammy 30 years ago, right? You remember the story? For better or worse, richer or poorer, in sickness and in health, until death you depart, right? That's a covenant. Before God and her, I promised, basically, you and me, babe, we're not getting out of this thing alive. We may kill each other, but we're, we're never going to leave each other, Okay? So in that time, do you think there's been maybe just, you know, just a couple of ups and downs in 30 years? Any of you married folks? I mean, you need to giggle a little louder than that. Anybody that's married knows, for holy smokes, right? Now, any of those struggles that we had in our marriage, days when I was selfish, days when I was grumpy, days when I was a jerk. Now, Tam's always an angel, but the problem's been me, Right? She's not here. She can't defend herself. So I'm just, I'm just going to talk about me. So all, all that, if we had a bad day, if you came to me and we had a bad day and you go, well, hey, how's Tam? Oh, I don't know. It was, it's a rough one. It's a rough one. It's really tough. And I might tell you about all the struggles I've been having over the last week with my, in my marriage or my own selfishness. But you see, we're in a covenant. The marriage was never in question. The marriage was never in question. It's just the ups and downs of the married life, okay? So once I've entered into covenant, now you realize this. By faith in Jesus, you are declared 100% righteous from the day you receive Christ until you see him face to face. You got it? By faith. That's called justification. Sanctification is the process that you're up and down and all over the place. And you're on the journey walking with the Lord. Now, when you examine yourself, Paul the Apostle, first you have to examine yourself to see if I'm in the faith. If you've believed in Jesus and his finished work on the cross, one day I'm going to stand before the Father. And if he asks me, why should I let you, Rick Brown, into my heaven? I'm going to say, because of the perfect, wonderful work your son did for me on that cross. And I believed it with all my heart. And he's going to say, enter into the joy of the Lord. I'm not going to show up and say, 
I did this or I did that or I was a good boy or I taught Sunday school or I read a lot of Bible verses or I preached a lot of sermons or I helped little old ladies across. I'm not going to say that. (laughs) None of that. I'm going to say your son did a perfect work and I 100% believe in what he did for me and therefore he promised that I could have come into your heaven and I'm believing that promise. All right. So when I examine myself, I need to understand positional righteousness by justification. Secondly, I understand that the journey of sanctification, everyone in, we're not going to have a show of hands, but some of you just came in here beat up. You've been, you know what? You've been making a mess of your life. You've been you're drifting back into your old habits, your old sin. or you're, I mean, you, you've got problems, right? But this is no failure for the Christian ever needs to be final because it's, you're just on your journey. Okay? Just keep going. Now, understanding that, you have to realize a couple of things. We can know that we are saved. There's no question mark. It says in 1 John 5, 13, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Did you get that? You may know, that you may know you have eternal life. It's not a question mark. I'm not hoping that I'm gonna get there I have received Jesus, Jesus finished the work, I am going to heaven on the basis of what somebody else has done. That spiritual confidence, that's not personal arrogance because I'm not bragging about what I've done except believing in Jesus. I'm bragging and boasting about what the Lord has done and I get to believe in it, okay? So you need that confidence as a Christian. What Jesus did, accomplished it, I believe in that and I know that I am going to heaven. Next I've discovered, this is more of the, I've just talked to you about Uh, basically objective truth from God's word, but now we move into that subjective work, the ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life as you examine your own life. Romans 8, 15, and 16, look at it. It says, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So, As the Holy Spirit now, as I receive Christ and the Holy Spirit fills me and I now sense that I'm adopted by God and I actually have this intimacy and this new inward, not religion is external, but relationship with God is internal. It comes from inside. I know I have a heavenly father that loves me and his son gave his life for me and I can cry, Abba, Father, and my fear is removed. Are you dominated by fear? Are you in the bondage of the fear? then you have not been made perfect in his love because now as I move into him, I have this incredible hope in Jesus and the spirit bears witness with my spirit. The Holy Spirit says to my spirit, you're a saved man, Rick. And that's when people say, how do you know, Rick, that you're saved? Now I can point at a bunch of Bible verses. They say, yeah, but that aside, I go, I know that I know that I know that I know. You see, some people struggle with the assurance of their salvation. That has never, ever, ever in my entire Christian life for 32 years ever been a struggle I have. I have other struggles, but that one has never been a struggle. It is a fact. I am more convinced of heaven than you guys sitting right in front of me. I am more convinced of the finished work of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, my Lord, than you guys sitting right in front of me. And one day I'm going to bust heaven wide open because of his grace and only because of his grace. And it's that confidence that the Spirit of God wants to produce in your heart and in your life. And he wants to pull out by the roots. He wants to rip the fear out of your hearts and fill you with the confidence in the finished work of who Jesus is. And not this kind of, well, you know, I kind of, I don't know. You know, I'm not really that. And I'm, I'm so, and people go through this. It's not about you, man. It's about what he did. You trust in him. You believe in him. You're just this weak, helpless little wimp that's hanging on to Jesus. Therefore, you're the rock of Gibraltar, man, because of what he has done. So the Spirit of God now begins to work inside of me, bearing witness with my spirit that I am a saved man, that you are a saved man or a saved woman. And you're crying out, Abba, Father. And all of a sudden, this fear has receded. This fear has begun to recede and evaporate I have a new peace, Romans 5.1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we talked about that in a strong way, justification by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, for the first time in my life, I have peace. I have the peace of God. I have a supernatural peace by faith in the finished work of Jesus. Do you got God's peace? Do you have his peace? Or do you have fear and anxiety? God wants to give you his security and his peace. 
And so if fear and anxiety rule your life, the world, the flesh, and the devil are lying to you and whispering in your ear. And God wants to bring his assurance by his spirit that you can call out Abba, Father, Daddy. You can have his peace. You can have his confidence by faith. Not only peace, but there's a new love inside of me. All these things are subjective. You see, it's this subjective work of the Spirit of God in my life. In Romans 5, 5, now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. I now have a love for people that I, I never had before. I never had a love like this before. I, I never had this affection. I never had this kind of love for somebody like supernatural love that God would give me for my wife, for my kids, for you guys as a church family, for other people, for strangers, for somebody that's lost. The, the Holy Spirit has shed his love abroad in my heart his, and, and his love abroad in your heart. Tammy, in her testimony, the day after she, the first day she went to school, after she received Christ, she said for the first time her eyes were open and she saw all of these people and for the first time in her heart, she had an affection for the people in the hallway at school that she had not had for 18 years of her life. And it just, the very next day, I mean, the day of school, because she received Christ in the summer and then started school just a little while later. And all of a sudden, there's this new love. How do you explain that? It's a sub, this uh, subjective work and ministry of the Holy Spirit. See, all these things, examine yourself. You got peace? You got his love? Do you understand the gospel? Can you cry, Abba, Father? Is peace dominating your life? Is fear receding from your life? Examine yourself. It, and I have this new desire, you see, to obey God's word. John in 1 John, he loves to say, we know, by this we know, and he gives us a test. He says in 1 John 2, 3 through 5, now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. How do you know if you know God? You want to obey him. It's really simple. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him and he's in us. How? I want to obey God. I did not want to obey God for 19 years of my life. I did not want to be around Christians. I did not want to read the Bible. I did not want to go to church. I did not want to hear about Jesus. And the day I got saved, all of a sudden I was like, man, i got to go buy me a Bible. I started reading it. Oh, I want to do that. God says that. God gives us a desire to follow him and obey him. And I don't want to disobey. Now, it doesn't mean that I don't in the weakness of the devil tempting me or my own flesh. Don't get me wrong. This is not some kind of perfection. This side of heaven, you are not going to experience perfection, but you're going to experience in the journey more of God's sanctifying work. You're going to grow as the process goes. But let me just ask you, do you want to obey God in a whole new way when you receive Christ? That's the work of his spirit. Did you want to start reading the Bible so you knew what it said? It, all of a sudden, there's this new desire. And I don't know if you're like me, but anytime somebody would put pressure on me externally to do things, I'd just shut my jaw and I'd want to rebel. That's just your sinful nature. Everybody wants to do that. And I'm just like, you're not telling me what to do. Who died and made you boss? Get out of my way. But Jesus comes inside and now it's that new covenant that Jeremiah 31 and Hebrews chapter 8 talks about and says God's written his law on our hearts and our minds and now it's inside. Now I, I want to please God inside. So nobody's going around shaking their finger at me telling me to do this. The Holy Spirit's inside. Jesus lives inside of me and he gives me a desire to obey him. Now I don't obey him perfectly. I don't want to give anybody ever that, that kind of perception. But I do have deep inside of me a desire to obey him. I don't do it perfectly. And you're not going to do it perfectly. But you do have that desire, right? If you don't have that, and it doesn't mean you also go through seasons where you're kind of rebellious or you want to drift back to your old lifestyle, your old sin. Another thing, we love God's people. It says in 1 John 3, 14, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. How do I know that I've passed from death to life? Because I love you guys. Now, think about it. Think about it. We're kind of an odd lot, right? 
We got some cowboys, we got some bikers, we got some straight laced people, we got some Mormons that's gotten saved, we got some Catholics, we got some just good heathen dogs like myself, we got we got meth addicts, we got drunks, we got sexually immoral people, we have bi- and all, and God saved us and He threw us all into the same room. He said, "Now you just have a group hug and love one another." Now think about it on a Wednesday night. If some of you were not saved 10 years ago, you would never think in a thousand years to come on a Wednesday night to a church and sit in a group of people like this. Ever. I went to the bar. That was my people. Let's go to the bar. Went and hung out. Who's got the drugs? You see, all of a sudden, when you fall in love with Jesus, you fall in love with his people. And God begins to expand your spiritual family. By this, we know that we've passed from death to life, that we are saved people because we love God's people and we want to hang out with God's people. He goes on and tells us one more thing before I come to a conclusion about this part is that we want to live right, a desire to live right. And it says in 1 John 2, 29, if you, if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. I went from darkness and death and sin and self-centeredness to wanting to live right. I wanted to find out what was right. I wanted to find out what God said was right. And I wanted to begin to do that because there's a righteousness that begins to work into your life. Once again, not a perfect righteousness this side of heaven and not some kind of smug, condescending righteousness that just makes you want to puke. It's nauseating. You're, I mean, don't swagger around your workplace even though all the people at work are unsaved. You are only one decision away from exactly where they're headed for hell, right? So don't take your self-righteous, smug, whatever perspective you have to your work and like, you know, oh, they're so this. And they're so, you look at them and say, that was you five years ago, right? That was you 10 years ago. That was you 20 years ago. I was doing this wedding some time ago and I went, and this guy, they, it was all military guys, and, they'd, and, and they were standing up, and they were drunk. I mean, they were lit up. They had been drinking for about two hours. And these guys are, and, they, and, and when I came in, hey, here's the preacher. <laughs> I thought, oh, this is going to be a humdinger here. This is going to be quite a wedding. I was over at uh, one of the hotels here in town, and, and I walked in. And only the groom, you see, these are all his friends, but he had just come to Christ, and he was wanting to walk with God. And he said, oh, pastor, I'm so sorry. You guys shut up. This is my pastor. And I said, hey, man, don't, don't be afraid on my account. These are, these are my people, you know. And they're like, oh, you're the people. And they, and they started, I mean, they, they were drunk. And so they just started saying some seriously crude stuff. And I just looked at them and said, you have no idea where I came from. I said, you're not embarrassing me. You might be embarrassing yourselves, but you're not embarrassing me. Because it's near impossible for you coming from where you're coming from right now to embarrass me because I was you. I was you. And you see, there needs to be this approachability. The only thing, only decision between you and a hell-bound person is the grace of Jesus that he snatched your wretched hide out of hell itself. And he saved you. So stop being so smug and condescending towards the heathen dogs you work with. Realize, have compassion on them because they're lost just like you were, right? My wife and I will be somewhere and somebody will be close to us and they'll just be cussing. I mean, like, you know where every other word's the F-bomb. That's just the only way they know how to cuss. And that's the way I talked. And I always walk away just praying for them. Man, that's just, I was just like that, man. Lord, save their hide. Just whatever it takes, go after them. Do a work in their life. So having said all of that, Can you examine yourself with all of those things? Did you examine yourself and process those things? Now, he gives us this exhortation, this farewell, if you will, in verse 11. Finally, brethren, farewell. Become complete. Be of good comfort. Be of one one mind. Live in peace. uh, And the God of peace, the God of love and peace will be with you. So in verse 11, he gives four little exhortations as he's saying farewell. All right? We're going to be brief. Number one, he says, be, become complete. This means there's a lot of growing that has to do, 
that has to happen in your life. Just because we're justified and we're righteous in God's sight by faith in Jesus, the moment we believe in Jesus, doesn't mean there's not a lot of growing to do. Like if somebody builds, lays a foundation for a house and maybe they built a wall or two and they're really excited about their wall or two, but you say, you know what, you probably should finish this house. It's, it's not done. And there's a lot of things that you can give yourself to and through prayer and reading the Bible and coming to church. These are things that help us grow. They're not things that save us. And you have to make that distinction. Those things help us grow. They don't save us. And so to become complete, and this is a, a, a picture, if you will, and this word's used in a number of ways, but it's a longing, a longing for people to become complete. As a pastor, I love to see people grow. And as you're sharing the word of someone, someone gets saved. But I've discovered, really, it takes five to ten years for, to really start seeing some growth that's outward. The inward growth's happening, but you don't see a lot of outward growth. I liken it to a, a newborn baby. When a newborn baby shows up, I remember being so frustrated as a new father because my son, I, I remember coming home with a football and a, and a kid's picture Bible that, that my wife and baby were kind of recovering in the hospital. And I was ready. I'm ready to have a Bible study. I'm ready to play, a, you know, some catch. And nothing happened for years, right? The baby just sits there and eats and messes his diapers and sleeps. And there's no, and, and you're like, come on, man. When's something going to be happening? And then they finally start crawling and then they're walking a little bit. And, but ultimately, you know, in the Bible, people did not really usually step into the fullness of their calling until they were 30, Right? I mean, David becomes king at 30. John the Baptist shows up on the scene for his ministry at 30. Joseph becomes right, goes to the right hand of the Pharaoh at 30. Jesus starts his ministry at, at the age of 30. What is the Bible indicating to us? That real radical maturity, though physical maturity, usually happens pretty rapidly into that 17 or 18 or 20 years of age as far as your height, your, your build, all those different things. But emotional, spiritual, uh, psychological maturity, doesn't, you're not really ready, to, good to go until you're 30. And I've just been walking with the Lord for 32 years, so I've finally just grown up. I feel like I just got out of kindergarten. Why is that? Because there's so much stuff that God has created inside of you. He's, what he's doing inside of you is he wants you to become complete. He wants you to mature. He wants you to grow in those things. So the first thing is to grow up. The second is to cheer up, be of good comfort. This means to be encouraged by God's love for you. Are you downhearted? Are you dark and, and uh, cynical and discouraged and uh, really kind of put out with life? Man, cheer up. Be of good comfort. God's for you. If God is for you, who can be against you? You can be encouraged. So you want to grow up, become complete. You want to cheer up to be of good comfort. And to, you want to give up to be of one mind and live in peace. Have you discovered, discovered that you have to give up certain opinions and arguments if you want to have peace with someone? Husbands and wives, figure that out. You know, in the early days of marriage, it's all about winning the fight. I'm a good arguer, man. I can win this fight. I can come at an angle, you know, I'm, I, I can make myself look good and, and make my precious wife look bad, and I'm, I'm gonna win this argument. And then after you win the argument, you kinda, man, I blew, whew, whew, I blew you away. But then the tenderness and the pain that you've just caused for the last, the next week of your life, the price of winning is painful. <laughs> Very painful. You know, it's all theoretic. But the reality is, is that, that ultimately to be of one mind means to surrender your opinions for the sake, not, you don't surrender truth, but you're, you're coming together and you're not wanting to be combative with your own opinions and you're wanting to walk in peace. And every Christian needs to do that. You know, some people came into this world ready to fight. I mean, they love to argue. They love their opinion. They're opinionated. And they, got, they're just, they just love to argue. They just love to fight. And they need to figure out how to give up. Give up your strong opinions. Keep your mouth shut if you know it's going to ignite some fire, some big contention. 
Just surrender, concede that point. Give up so that you might have unity and you might have peace and that you might be of one mind. Fourthly, we need to look up because it says, the God of love and peace will be with you. You see, we can grieve the Spirit of God. God wants to make himself known in your heart and in your life and the reality of your life as you are growing in him that you would become complete as you're looking to him and cheering up and being encouraged and to give up and surrender your opinions to his will so that he can enjoy fellowship with you and you can enjoy fellowship with him. And then Paul brings it to a conclusion with one of the epic benedictions of all of the Bible in verses 12 through 14. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. He tells us in this closing affection, he says, greet one another with a holy kiss. Or we just, why, why do we greet one another every service? Why do we choose a time on Sundays, or Saturdays and Sundays, after the first service, before we receive the offering, hey, why don't you greet one another? Do you think, is that like a time filler? Do you think we're saying, you know what, we need to fill about two minutes of time here, and we're trying to make it a well-rounded, filled up time, and so we'd, we'll just take a little time. No. It's because we're waiting for, uh, you know, usually at, w- at least one song, the majority of the people that are going to be here are here, or we have greeting right before I share my message. Hey, greet one another because the Bible says to greet one another with a holy kiss. Now, we don't ask you to kiss one another, okay? It's really a cultural thing. So we shake hands or give somebody a hug. And when they did kiss one another with a holy kiss, women would kiss women on the cheek and men would kiss men. And even, you know, in Middle Eastern areas, they'll still do that to this day. And it's a holy kiss. He had to distinguish that because, you know, single guys come to church and they're going to, hey, they're going to say, turn and kiss somebody. And so they're going to get next to this little hottie over here and give her a big unholy smooch. So it's not a a sensual makeout session. You can imagine all of us stop that we're gonna go on with the message and knock it off but we in our culture it's more like greet one another with a handshake or a hug and depending on your uh, uh your personal atmospheric comfort if you're okay with a handshake or if you're okay with a hug and uh um so the congregation when when people come here not only you But our goal is, in obedience to God's word, to greet one another. And this means individually as we see each other. But we don't want anybody to escape here without somebody shaking their hand, without somebody saying good morning or good evening or how are you or smiling. Because we know how many brokenhearted people come into the house of the Lord. And we want to extend. You know, for some people that are lonely, that this might be the only time they have physical touch this whole week. Somebody's shaking their hand and saying, God bless you. God bless you. Great to see you tonight. And just a smile, somebody to be kind. Maybe they're going through a hard time in relationships and they came into the house of the Lord and they saw the affection. He says, all the saints greet you. He was sending a greeting from where he was. And then he says in this benediction in verse 14, he uses, basically we have the the trinity here, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're gonna leave you with this tonight. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. The grace of Jesus is the unmerited, unearned favor that you can open up your arms. You don't deserve it. You've never earned it. You're never going to deserve it. And you can open up your arms and you can receive this kindness and this favor and that Jesus in his grace, it was his grace that brought him to earth to take on human flesh, to be born in a manger, to grow up in uh, Nazareth, to live a sinless life, to minister for three and a half years and ultimately go to a brutal cross for you and for me and allow them to drive spikes through his hands and his feet and kill him and put him in a tomb and to rise from the dead. It was his grace, his love, his favor for you and I, not just 2,000 years ago for those disciples that were alive, but for the sins of the entire world. He sees you. He knows you by name. The the hairs upon your head are not. Jesus is grace. May it go with you. It's for you. I don't care if you're the worst person on planet earth. Jesus' grace is reaching towards you. So may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, the Father, the love of God that he so loved the world that he sent his son. You see, Jesus in his grace came for us and the Father in his love sent him and supported that and wanted you to experience love. 
love that is pure, love that is the height, the depth, the width, the length, this incredible love of God. God loves you. God loves me. And may God's love be with you. And lastly, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. The communion of the Spirit of God that lives in us and ministers to us and the the Holy Spirit that was poured out at Pentecost and the Holy Spirit that's been given to every believer that believes in Jesus for 2,000 years. You can have fellowship with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God that has drawn me closer, 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 ever closer in my walk with God. I'm enjoying Jesus' grace. I'm enjoying God's love. I'm enjoying fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And Paul the Apostle wants all of us, as he declares this benediction, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion or fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. You see, when we come to the house of the Lord, We need to experience grace, we need to experience love, and we need to experience the touch and the ministry of the Spirit of God in our life. We need our life touched and elevated by this incredible God that cares so much for us that he came up with this radical plan called salvation for mankind, for you and me. It's not a bunch of religious mumbo jumbo for big cathedrals in Europe filled with birds and no people. It is for brokenhearted people like you and me that have experienced the pain of life, the suffering of life, the sin of life, the selfishness of life, the hurt of life, and God loves and is near and will bind up the brokenhearted. That's the God we serve. So examine yourself. Is Christ in you and are you in him? If you are, You are the most blessed person on planet Earth. What the billionaires and the millionaires have in this world is nothing in comparison to the love, joy, and peace that you and I get served on a silver platter every single day of our life. Let's pray. Father, I just pray that you would pour out your grace, that you'd pour out your love, that you'd pour out your spirit right now. Lord, I pray that you would overwhelm us with your power and your presence and your love for us. Lord, we just want to enjoy you tonight. We pray that your grace, Lord Jesus, and your love, Father, and the fellowship of you, precious Spirit, would just be with us all. We just commit our lives to you. And I just pray for those who need to examine themselves. See if they're in the faith. See if Jesus is Lord. That you would draw them now, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.